Hi everyone, it's Michelle and welcome back to the Royal Daily Tea History and Fashion channel. Today we're embarking on the second episode of Karina and the King. This episode, Red Flags. So we're two years now into the love affair of Karina and King Juan Carlos I. This is around 2006. So Juan Carlos and Karina settle into their fake marriage, their fake family, living in their little love nest hidden on the grounds of Zarzula Palace, where just mere feet away his wife, Queen Sophia, lives. But in their charming little casita, Karina feels like she's married to the king. He is the husband of her heart. But Karina is determined to really get to know the man, Juan Carlos, the man she is in love with, the man who is a surrogate father to her son, Prince Alexander, the man she finds out to be much more complex than meets the eye. She realizes that Juan Carlos is a chameleon. He has a way of making you feel like you're the only person in the room. He is a king. He is a hero. He is a family man. He is one of the people. He is a charmer. He is a man who wears many personalities and many facades. But she really wanted to get to the heart of the man who she was sharing a home with on the grounds of the palace. So Juan Carlos was a man of many facades. He had the ability and talent to make you feel like you were the only person in the room. He was a people reader and a people pleaser, and that is why he was so good at being king. But Karina soon realized that the man was troubled. He had a troubled and traumatic childhood. At the age of 10, he was literally handed over to a dictator from his father, who had ambitions of becoming the next king of Spain. When Juan Carlos was 18, a very traumatic situation happened that literally has haunted him from that day. It was 1956 in Portugal. Juan Carlos was on Easter break visiting his family. He was on Easter holiday from military school. Now the story goes that his younger brother, who was four years younger than him, his brother Alfonso de Bourbon was 14 and Juan Carlos was 18. Now the rumor is, is that the brother was the favored son compared to Juan Carlos who was literally handed over to a dictator. But his brother had the best life. He had the best schools, the best clothes. He was very good looking. He was very personable. He was very athletic. He was the apple of his father's eye. Now, some say there could have been some sibling rivalry happening between the brothers. We don't know. But a horrible accident happened. It was a mystery and covered up for 20 years. The rumor is, is that uh, Juan Carlos was cleaning his gun and his younger brother came home from a soccer game and wanted to show him his trophy that he won during a game and that Juan Carlos accidentally shot him and he immediately was shot in the head and died instantly. But according to Karina, one night she asked him about the death of his brother and what really happened. And he tells her the story of how his brother had come home running in the room and showing him his trophy, he was all happy. And he started playing with Juan Carlos, hands up, put your hands up, rat -ta -ta -ta. you know, pretending to shoot him with a gun made of his fingers. And Juan Carlos says, oh, you're going to shoot me. Well, I'll show you a gun. And he opens up a drawer, pulls out the gun, aims it, and fires. Now, unbeknownst to Juan Carlos, the gun was loaded. So at that time, his father comes running in, and one of his childhood friends was also there visiting on Easter break. Everyone was in another room. They come running in. His father immediately accuses him, did you do this on purpose? Did you kill your brother? And of course, Juan Carlos is like, no, this was an accident. But his father never believed him because again, the brother was the favored son Juan Carlos was shipped off literally like child labor, like slave labor attached to this horrific dictator. And his brother is out home living the best life. So his father never really got over this accident. They covered it up. They never said how 
the younger son died. There was no investigation and there was no autopsy. It was a quick funeral and it was done. It was never found out about for 20 years until around 1975, around his coronation, that the story broke of how he actually had shot his brother. But they changed the story saying he was cleaning the gun. But according to Karina, it was a little bit of a different story. But that has traveled with him for years and has haunted him for years. You would think he'd be afraid of using guns, but he still had a very big obsession with guns. His father never really recovered from the death of his beloved son. His mother became a raging alcoholic, so much so she would drink perfume bottles. And Juan Carlos was shipped back to the dictator and military school. So to say that this kind of shaped him as a person, being raised by a vicious dictator, uh, shunned by your father and your mother, kind of not really being there for you as a child, and then going through the trauma of knowing that you caused the death of your younger brother, which was a pure accident, as an 18 year old boy, that has to be traumatic. So these are things that haunted Juan Carlos for the rest of his life. And Karina began to realize that Juan Carlos was a very complex man. Now Karina and the King started to become very serious in their relationship and they kind of became the secret power couple behind the palace walls. For the public, they had their adored and beloved royal family with King Carlos, his children, and Queen Sophia. They had a very public persona that was very, very important to uphold for the longevity of the royal family. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, it was very well known that they lived two separate lives, so much so that the palace was sectioned off behind an electronic door in a hallway. You had Queen Sophia's side of the palace, and you have King Juan Carlos's side of the palace, and they each had their own staff. And it got to the point where Queen Sophia's staff and Juan Carlos's staff would spy on each other and report back to the opposite camp. Now, Queen Sophia knew of Juan Carlos's extramarital affairs. I mean, how can you not? He bedded close to 5,000 women over the course of their marriage. He even had a mistress for 20 years. There was a rumor of an 18-year-old woman he had an affair with a beauty queen who became pregnant and somehow leapt off a balcony to her death. That's a whole other story in itself. Many people have come forward claiming to be the illegitimate kid of Juan Carlos, but because he was the king and he was very powerful, he had immunity, so nothing has ever been proven. Now, Queen Sophia was aware of these women. She did not care because, again, she was the queen. They were throwaway accessory women. They were nothing. Queen Sophia was the daughter of a king, the sister of a king, the wife of a king, and the mother of a future king. She was a queen through and through. So to her, as long as she was queen and she upheld her duty to her country, she didn't care if her husband had these throwaway mistresses. As long as they held that public persona, she was okay. However, Queen Sophia started to learn of Karina, this woman, this mistress, who was beginning to overstep her bounds as a mistress. She was breaking the cardinal rule of mistresses. So Sophia's camp started to learn more and more about this woman, Karina, who was acting like the wife of King Juan Carlos at the casita. Behind the scenes, they were acting like they were the power couple, and the queen was not happy. Now, Karina at the time begins to give the king all sorts of advice how to run his household, his staff, even Spain. She is, after all, a businesswoman with a background in diplomacy. He would have her proofread his government documents and translate his documents into French or English. So his government officials and associates were now becoming extremely annoyed that this mistress is all of a sudden involved in state and government affairs. Why is this mistress here? She's overstepping her bounds. Now, the closer she became to the king, the more enemies 
she started to make in the palace. People became very jealous of her. And now Queen Sophia is starting to hear rumors and whispers of her behind the scenes and that she is in Queen Sophia's crosshairs. Now at this time, Karina also notices that Juan Carlos is a man of luxury. He sure likes his accessories, his nice things, his cars, expensive trips. He would come home with suitcases full of money, a million dollars in cash in a briefcase. And she was always, where did you get that? What's going on? And he would say, you don't understand how Spain works. And she clearly didn't because as a royal family, they were afforded $9 million a year from the taxpayers to run the royal household. So everything on paper was above board, but Juan Carlos would have suitcases full of money. If he said he liked something, cases of it would arrive the next day. She said it was like Christmas. His wish was their command. People went out of their way to please King Juan Carlos. Again, he was considered a hero to the people of Spain. So if he liked your wine, cases upon cases would arrive the next day. Rolls Royces, Mercedes, expensive watches, food baskets, you name it, caviar would, would arrive by the truckloads. It was excess. Karina became a little worried and concerned about these suitcases of money that would just show up and these Mercedes and these expensive trips that were paid for by other people. And Juan Carlos would simply say, you don't know how Spain works. He would shut her down, never explain where he got the money, where he got the gifts. But again, he was literally a hero and people would trip over themselves to give him presents. It was his wish is your command. Whatever he wanted, he would get, but he would get 10 of them. Nothing was too grand for Juan Carlos. Now it got to the point where Karina, again, she was helping him to run his household, his staff on his side of the palace. She suggested that some of these gifts that were going to waste, that they hand out as Christmas gifts to his staff. So of course, Juan Carlos's staff started to receive these really huge swag bags, expensive gifts, and of course, Queen Sophia's side of the palace got nothing. So to say there was a lot of animosity in the palace is an understatement. Now, Karina was very careful not to run amok. She never wanted to invade uh, Queen Sophia's turf on the palace. She mostly stayed at the casita, although the king was begging her to come to the palace. So one day, Karina's entertaining an out-of-town guest. The king says, you can come to the palace. I will give you and your friend a tour personally of the palace grounds. And Queen Sophia, she is not in town. So Karina goes to the palace, they walk around, the king is giving her literally a guided tour with her friend and Queen Sophia barges into the room and she screams, I know who you are and I know what you're doing. How dare you show your face? Now, of course, Karina is taken aback because she did not expect the queen to be there. And she looks over at Juan Carlos and he looked like a deer in the headlights, literally too stunned to speak, sat there and clearly afraid of his wife. So Karina is super embarrassed. She has her friend who's just sitting there like, what is going on? So they leave the palace and now she knows that Sophia definitely knows who she is, what's going on. And she is in the queen's crosshairs because now the queen's pissed that you're sitting here helping him with his staff, you're giving out gifts, you're conducting state official business, you're sitting in on business meetings, and now you're going to have a tour of my home, the palace? Oh, she's pissed. So now Sophia is declaring war on her number one threat, Karina. So now Queen Sophia is pissed because this mistress has overstepped and she's letting Karina know, I know who you are and I'm gonna squash you. And Juan Carlos just sat there. So now Karina is freaked out because the queen, who is known to have a little bit of a temper, 
knows who she is, has confronted her, and Juan Carlos is sitting there with his mouth open, staring into space, doing nothing at all. So around this time, 2006, there was a really big deal that was happening between Saudi Arabia and Spain. It was the land project contract and the king had specifically asked Karina to join him on this state event. He wanted her to be there working on this deal. Now when Karina shows up at the airport to get on the private royal plane, all of a sudden she notices Queen Sophia is there now Queen Sophia never attended the state tour she never wanted to go and all of a sudden there she is so now it is extremely awkward that Karina the mistress of the king is trying to board the royal plane with all of their staffers and government agency and everyone knows exactly who she is and what's happening and the queen so Juan Carlos and the queen are in the royal cabin of the airplane everyone is staring at Karina like why the hell are you here and she quietly has to go to her seat holds her head down in shame and just gets on with business for this extremely long flight the problem is is she was planning to stay with the king but now Queen Sophia plotting her revenge threw a wrench in her plan so now Karina an unmarried woman traveling with all of these men in the Middle East is a big no-no. They didn't know what to do with her because she was an unaccompanied, unmarried woman who literally couldn't order a drink, she couldn't order dinner, nothing. It had to be done through a man. Remember, she's in a very strict Middle Eastern country where they view women a lot lower. So it's very awkward that she's now having to stay in this hotel with all of these people who work as staffers and, you know, state officials who work with the king. And he's in the royal suites with the queen <laughs> where she was technically supposed to be. Unfortunately, during this trip, it turns out that the train deal was not given to Spain. It was a $5 billion bilateral fund, but instead, this trip to Saudi Arabia turned into three days of hell. There was no room for her on the plane on the way back. They made it very clear, there's no room for you. So she had to go by herself on another flight while everyone else left her. Now the problem she had was the fact that the king did absolutely nothing. He didn't speak to her, he ignored her, he left her there for her own devices. Knowing the fact he had personally invited her on this trip to help land this deal, and she was part of the meetings, but she literally got the shaft because the queen decided to show up. So at this point, when she landed back in Spain, her and the king started fighting. The relationship wasn't going the way that she wanted. And then she also found out that Queen Sophia was slamming her name through the mud, calling her a hussy and a husband stealer. So much so, her reputation in Spain started to tank. She had enemies in the palace, enemies in high society, so much so that her children were being snubbed at birthday parties, they were considered outcast. Queen Sophia was trying to ruin her and her reputation. Again, Queen Sophia was out for revenge. So at this point, she decided in 2007, she'd had enough. The king didn't stand up for her. She was being smeared all over high society. So she moves to Monaco where she works as an advisor to Princess Charlene and Prince Albert and opens up her own company. Now during this time, a funny thing happens. They start a long distance relationship and her and the king become close once again over the next two years. Now back in January of 2009, five years into the relationship, the king proposes to Karina. Now, he had been saying since 2005 that he wanted to marry her, but she always knew he would never be able to marry her because he could never divorce Queen Sophia. It was never going to happen. But he did present her with a beautiful emerald cut diamond ring with two trident diamonds on the side. It was more of a symbolic bonding. 
than a marriage proposal. Now, Karina was afraid to be seen in public wearing such an elaborate ring, but they would show it to people in private to their friends. So everyone knew they were engaged. She was very excited about it. She felt very close to the king. Again, she had been with him for five years. She felt that he was the love of her life. He told her she was the love of his life. They were engaged, although it was symbolic. And then, unfortunately, her father becomes very, very ill with terminal cancer. So she flies off to be with her father in Germany for the next eight months. She's talking to the king every day on the phone. He's being very sweet. He's being very supportive. And while she's there in Germany, her father lets her know that the king had called him and asked his permission to marry his daughter. And she was very struck by that, that he actually went and asked for her father's permission. He proposed to her like it was a real engagement that obviously was never going to lead to a real marriage, but it was still a very symbolic moment for them. And now when she returns back to Spain after being gone for eight months to attend her father's funeral in Frankfurt and to be by his side while he is battling terminal cancer, they're sitting at the casita one night and Juan Carlos tells her, I'm sorry to tell you this, but there's someone else. He tells her that he started seeing someone else three years ago. So she is so hurt and stunned that this man who had literally proposed to her eight months before had been with her for five years, said she was the love of his life, was cheating on her with another mistress. That's right, another mistress. So she is just beyond. So she ends the relationship with him right then and there. She realizes the king was a master game player. He's a chameleon of personalities. He can make you feel like you were the only person in the world. And now she feels duped. She then realizes he is an actor playing with multiple personalities. But for how long can he keep up this charade? So not only did Karina realize that a cheater is always a cheater, that you can't trust this man she begins to see his mask starting to slip and the real Juan Carlos emerges. Now when I tell you we haven't even got to the best part of the story, I'm not kidding you guys. This is where it starts to get good. So make sure guys that you stay tuned for part three of Corina and the king. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. Please be sure to like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you in the next video. Bye, guys.